A few years ago, I became interested in LoRa as an efficient way of communicating field environmental conditions from remote sites over radio. The published range of these little low-power radios intrigued me, so I set up a couple LoRa transceivers and tested range in both urban and rangeland settings. The results are available in the description of this video. Suffice it to say that if you have good line of sight, you can easily get about one kilometer of transmission in urban settings without any special considerations. In fact, if you've searched YouTube for videos on LoRa, you've probably run across this guy with a Swiss accent who successfully demonstrated that LoRa can transmit hundreds of kilometers under absolutely ideal conditions, the most important of which is good line of sight. With respect to my own shared experiments, these were based on a bare-bones, out-of-the-box approach without a clear understanding of LoRa communications and potential interferences. So my results represent the bare minimum of what you can accomplish. I'm revisiting all this today since a couple months ago, friends at a local hackerspace invited me to set up a LoRa gateway on Zero Crafts Community Radio Tower. In preparing for this project, I'll share what I've learned from the point of view of someone who is completely new to radio communications and likely asking many of the same questions you might be asking about engineering your own LoRa gateway. Along those lines, consider the next few minutes to be a copy of the first of many chapters of my lab notebook that will log progress on this project. To kick things off, let me do a quick recap on gateways. A gateway typically refers to the hardware and software that will help me connect sensors to the cloud whose data can then be accessed by desktop and mobile computing hardware. In my prior videos, I've demonstrated using Wi-Fi, cellular, or satellite remote environmental monitors as gateways to the Internet of Things. A LoRaWAN gateway has the added benefit that it can talk to sensors over radio over very long distances, thus freeing us from limited Wi-Fi range or costs for cellular and satellite communications. The trade-off is that LoRa is very low bandwidth, but that's not really an issue if all we're streaming is sensor data. Another benefit is that LoRa transceivers are very low power, thus making them ideal for battery or solar-powered remote deployments, at least with respect to LoRa nodes that will communicate with the gateway. This opens up all kinds of possibilities for remote environmental monitoring independent of the relatively expensive cellular or satellite networks I've been experimenting with, at least where environmental conditions will allow for the same. In order to do this, I purchased this 8-channel LoRa gateway kit from Adafruit composed of a rack concentrator and a Raspberry Pi capable of realizing a formal LoRaWAN gateway. Keep in mind that you certainly don't have to start with something this expensive. Adafruit offers much cheaper alternatives, including LoRa radios mounted on their Feather MOs, but in the interest of wanting to set up a formal gateway, I decided to test this upgrade. So this is a diagram of the setup I'm hoping to realize for ZeroCraft. Upon drawing this out, a bunch of questions started coming to mind, such as, what kind of coax cable do I use for raising the antenna? How much power is my antenna going to put out? Do I need to purchase a larger antenna for good coverage? And since I'm attaching this to a radio tower, what are the FCC regs that need to be respected? So let's start with the coax cable. One of the first things I learned was that I can lose significant power between my hardware and antenna depending on how I engineer the connection. As such, it's important to use high quality coax cable while keeping your leads short. But there are a whole slew of coax cable options, and for someone who knows little about radio, which one should I select, and how much power loss might I expect? In researching these options, I learned that coax cables differ in terms of their maximum voltage rating capacitance and maximum frequency, but the rule of thumb is that the larger the conductor, the lower the power loss. Comparing the two conductors for these particular cables shows that LMR400 hosts a larger conductor. And the rule of thumb is confirmed in the smaller dB attenuation per 100 feet of cable at 915 MHz. Of course, for a beginner like me, that raises the question, what the heck is a dB? dB is not an absolute value, rather it's just a way of expressing gain or loss as a power out over power in ratio in log space. If I just lost you, let me break this down a little bit more. The bottom line is we can rearrange this formula to determine what the power attenuation and resulting output power will be for LMR400 coax cable. Let's walk through this example. Let's assume we have an input power from our LoRa transmitter of 250 milliwatts. 
Let's also assume that we're running about 100 feet of LMR400 cable to our antenna, which we know has an attenuation of 4.1 dB. Our dB in this instance will be negative 4.1 because we know the cable is attenuating or dropping power over our assumed 100 feet of cable. We can then plug these values into our output power equation, which yields 97 milliwatts being delivered to our antenna. As such, that 4.1 dB attenuation over 100 feet of LMR400 coax translates to a 61% loss of power being delivered to my antenna. That's quite a bit of power loss, but given the low sensitivity of LoRa radios, it's not a deal breaker as you'll see shortly. I can do a similar calculation for RG213 coax, which yields a much higher power loss, likely associated with the smaller conductor size and in line with the rule of thumb regarding greater power loss for smaller conductors. Here are some additional details for LMR400 that verify it works with a 900 MHz signal and that it can also handle wattages that are orders of magnitude greater than what I'll be generating by my LoRa rack transmitter. So this does look like a good fit. This description is for stranded core, which is flexible. But note that it's also available in solid core, which is stiffer and will provide the same performance. In fact, shopping at my local electronics store, solid core is all I could find, coming in at about a buck fifty-five a foot after taxes. So now that I understand dB attenuation for my selected coax, how do I calculate how much power will be delivered to my LoRa antenna for my formal setup? To calculate this, I'll need the dB attenuation for my coax, which I know is 4.1 dB over 100 feet, I'm going to need the distance between my LoRa radio and the antenna, and I'm also going to need to know the output power associated with my radio. Let's attack the distance first. I'm told the elevation anticipated for the antenna will be about 3.8 meters above the building roof. Once I consider the additional cable needed to feed through the roof via conduit, I anticipate a total length of about 7 meters of coax which is captured in this conceptual diagram. Next, what about the power output from my LoRa radio? Well, this came from the TX power spec associated with the rack concentrator for the kit that I purchased, and it's reported to be about 25 dBm. But wait, now I'm dealing with yet another dB unit, and this one has an M at the end. What is a dBm, and how do I get this into milliwatts? dBm is just another way of expressing power in log space, but in this case, the output power is referenced to 1 milliwatt input power. This turns the output power equation into this simple formula. Now, substituting the spec for the power provided by the LoRa radio, we can see how I arrived at 316 milliwatts from the specified 25 dBm in the spec sheet. There are many online calculators and tables that will help you do the conversion from dBm to milliwatts, but at least now you know where the calculation came from. As a check, here you can see that my calculated 316 milliwatts is in the ballpark of 25 dBm, giving me confidence that my math is okay. This 316 milliwatts now becomes my input power into my coax. We can now use the power relationship equation substituting 316 milliwatts for power in. We then normalize the power loss of 4.1 dB over 100 feet by the actual length of the cable we're going to use, which gives us 0.943 dB of loss. Substituting respective values in the equation yields 254 milliwatts of power being delivered to my antenna after traveling through 7 meters of LMR 400 coax cable, which is a loss of about 20%. With that info, I can now fill in one more piece of my conceptual drawing. But what about the power that actually gets transmitted by the antenna? In reviewing the spec sheet for the provided antenna, I see it realizes 2.0 dBi of gain. Great, now I've got a new unit of dBi to contend with. What's that about? Well, dBi is a measure of the forward gain of an antenna, or the gain in power emitted by an antenna signal. But wait, how does an antenna add power to the system via gain? After all, nothing is free. In fact, although a higher dBi augments the range of the antenna, 
It also steals radiated energy from some directions to intensify others. These are some example graphics I found on the web that make this case. For this reason, if you don't intend to point your antenna in a particular direction, then you may not want a lot of gain since an increase in horizontal coverage comes at the expense of losing coverage in the vertical direction. For the antenna that comes with my LoRa radio, which is similar to most of the generic variants of LoRa antennas, 2dBi is fairly common. Now that I have a better understanding of antenna gain, how does a 2dBi antenna impact my transmitted power? To explain this a little more clearly, we can return to this power relationship and use the power being delivered to our antenna at the end of the cable as our input power. We know the antenna gain is 2dBi, which will yield a 403 milliwatt signal from the antenna itself. So now I have one more item that I can add to my conceptual diagram. Out of curiosity, I compared this 403 milliwatts to what's permissible by the FCC at the 915 megahertz frequency used by LoRa, and learned it's well within the one watt maximum allowed for this frequency, so I don't think this setup will be getting my friends at ZeroCraft in any trouble with the FCC. Frankly, I wasn't expecting any issues with this hardware since it is certified by the FCC for the stated purpose, but at least we now have a better understanding of this hardware's capabilities and overall regulatory limits. Now, 403 milliwatts really isn't a lot of power, so I wondered exactly what kind of reliable coverage I might yield from this setup. The coverage of my setup will be dependent on several other variables, such as path loss, antenna gain of my receiver, and additional losses associated with my receiver. All these factor into a link margin that's a function of my LoRa receiver sensitivity. The bottom line is the link margin must be positive in order for signals to be successfully received and demodulated by my receiver. I'll get into further details about link budget in a future video. Suffice it to say that the most important aspect of ensuring good coverage for LoRa is good line of sight. To help evaluate coverage, there's this wonderful free website that allows you to realize coverage maps as a function of your transmitter elevation and power output. It does this by evaluating line of sight based on publicly available digital elevation models. I'll demonstrate using this website to evaluate line of sight coverage for the ZeroCraft setup next. To use this website, you'll need to create an account and once you do so, you'll have an opportunity to drop a pin on a map to capture the location of your transmitter. When you select a new site, it will calculate the ground elevation of your transmitter based on those digital elevation models. With our site registered, we can now calculate what the expected coverage will be for our setup at ZeroCraft. To do this, we select New Coverage from the provided table of contents, which yields this table. This was a little intimidating when I first came across it, but actually having a good conceptual model like the one we built for ZeroCraft makes this much easier to fill out. First, let's set the height of our antenna above ground level here. I'm approximating the total elevation to be about 50 feet, which is close to 15 meters. Next, if you're gonna use a standard omnidirectional antenna that comes with most LoRa transceivers, reference the spec sheet for the antenna gain or just use these defaults for a good approximation. For our purposes, the mobile antenna parameters refer to the height and gain of our LoRa nodes. Since we don't yet have these installed, we can use the provided numbers as defaults as a reasonable approximation. Of course, the frequency we're using here in the US for LoRa is 915 megahertz. This may be different for you depending on your own local rules and regs if you live outside of the United States. And we know from our LoRa radio specs that the typical output power of the radio is 25 dBm, which we know is 316 milliwatts as I demonstrated in our prior calculations. And we already know that the power loss associated with our coax cable is gonna be about 0.94 dB as demonstrated in prior calculations. Also, we know that our transmitter antenna is going to realize about 2.0 dBi of gain, which gets populated here. Since the line loss associated with our LoRa sensor nodes will likely be minimal due to short antenna connections, 
This is a good default value to reference for the same. And finally, we can set a strong signal margin to ensure good communication with our LoRa nodes. Given I'm relatively new to all this, I'll assume that the default 10 dB is reasonable for this first approximation of coverage. I can then play with these settings, which will impact what my coverage map will look like. For now, let's just take the default. One last item, you're probably wondering where I came up with this lowest receiver sensitivity number. I researched this from the SenTech transceiver specs, which are embedded in LoRa radios. Here you can see that the uh, default sensitivity is about negative 148 dBm, which is very low. But when I cross-reference this with the spec sheet for the rack concentrator that I'm using for this application, I found out I should probably be using negative 139 dBm. So that's how I came up with this Rx threshold value, which was arrived at by experimenting with different numbers until it matched the specified threshold in dBm. With my table populated, I can now click on Submit. The website will then start crunching my coverage map, and the output will result in something that looks like this with the green areas being those areas that I can expect to see pretty good coverage, not accounting for path losses. The website lets you toggle on uh, various features such as topography and roads, which is really useful, and you can also turn on aerial maps. In this example, I can see that ZeroCraft's future installation should provide coverage for the University of Arizona, as well as the community where I live, Again, not taking into account loss of coverage associated with buildings or vegetation obstructing line of sight. Along those lines, one thing we need to take into consideration with respect to coverage is path loss, which is associated with interference from natural barriers like forests and man-made structures like buildings and windows. Such features can further impact transmitted energy to our LoRa receivers, thus impacting the effective coverage predicted by the Radio Mobile website. In fact, this was something I hadn't considered in my first experiments in testing LoRa range, since the transmitter used for the same was located behind a leaded glass window, thus impacting my transmitted power and link budget. To get a better feel for potential interferences associated with the ZeroCraft location, I'll conclude this presentation with a visit to ZeroCraft to do a quick survey of the surrounding area and provide you with a brief view of the space where we will be installing this gateway. So briefly, this was video that I shot yesterday. You can see the antenna on the backside of ZeroCraft. Now I'm approaching ZeroCraft from the front. There's the antenna. And this is just kind of an overview of what the city looks like in this uh, industrial part of town. This is an old railroad town. ZeroCraft is actually located in an old railroad warehouse. And I was fortunate that uh, ZeroCraft was open the day that I visited. Uh, this is just to kind of show you what the lobby of ZeroCraft looks like. And uh, this is the space uh, with that conduit coming from the roof that uh, will host uh, the Raspberry Pi and our antenna. In my next chapter, I'll go over installing our antenna on the tower, again from the point of view of someone who is brand new to all this, in the hopes it might help others extend the number of available LoRa WAN gateways in our community. Hope you enjoyed this video, subscribe for updates, and I'll see you next time.